Uh, I do want to draw your attention to a few of the things that are uh, in your announcements. We have on Tuesday night, meet our new Bishop Hector Burgos Nunez. We just call him Bishop Hector. It's easier. Uh, that starts at 6.30 Tuesday night at Faith in Belfont. This is, I believe it's more of a program. It's not really just a drop by. So if you would like to attend, you want to be there at 6.30 for the start or just know that it will be in progress if you would get there a little later. On a Wednesday, just a note there, I'm going to be at Mount Nittany United Methodist Church for the district retreat that day. It just simply means if you're having trouble reaching me and you have an urgent need, you can even call the church to get a hold of me, but I will have my phone with me. It's just in there. Sometimes I don't have service, depending where I am in the building. On Thursday morning is the next Ladies Coffee and Conversation. That starts at 9.30 at St. James in Coburn. There is a an opportunity for some training there, the Refresh Your Innovation. If you're interested in that, you can read about that there. We have the fourth quarter Staff Parish Relations Committee meeting coming up October 23rd at St. James at 7. Uh, at the end of this month, on October 26th, my son gets married, which means the following day we'll be cleaning up after the wedding. So Edie Herzog will be in the pulpit that day. I'm taking a, a couple of days off before and after, but not October 29th. So that Tuesday night is our church conference, begins at 6.30 at Faith in Spring Mills. Um, we do have a sign-up sheet in the back. I'm pretty sure I have it back there, I think. If not, it'll be there next week, uh, and it'll be for you to sign up to, to have your packet. I want to try to get an accurate count, so I, I'm not making too many or too few, um, but that way you'll have your packet there. You'd want to come a little early so that you can go through it if you don't take time to... Uh, Look at it online beforehand so that any questions can be answered because we will start right at 6.30. We are going to be doing an Advent book study. The way that it seems to work best and we get the most people is doing it by Zoom. So it'll be on Monday nights from 7 to 8. The book is really good. It's a new one put out by Rob Fouquet and it's called On the Way to Bethlehem. There is a, a flyer in the back and on the bulletin board downstairs you can read a little more about the book. It's a very good book. If you're into uh, history, geography, understanding the places where the Christmas story takes place and how they impact the story, you might enjoy the book very much, whether you do the study or not. And then just a reminder about when our Christmas Eve services will be held. Same schedule as last year, 3 p.m. here at Spruce Town and 6 p.m. at St. James. So please make sure you get those invitations out to folks. Uh, and I wanted to let you know that we do have um, Trinity Woodward Ladies' Aid selling those pecans for $10 a 16 ounce bag, the price hasn't gone up in years, although everything else has. Uh, but if you do need pecans, just let me know. I can always grab them when I'm there first service and bring them to you here later in the morning. So if you do need some, just let me know and I can bring them with me and take your money back. Um, any other announcements to share this morning? Then seeing none, I wanna draw your attention to our centering words for today. Whoever wishes to be first among you must be the servant of all, for the human one came not to be served, but to serve. Let us uh, prepare now for the service with the service of the acolyte. Before we rise, just a few words. The gospel of Christ is good news, but sometimes the good news of Jesus sounds like bad news. Jesus is the teacher who tells us the truth. He will not lie to you, and he will not lie for you. And that means sometimes that truth is going to hurt, but it's necessary in order to heal. Fortunately for us, Jesus is a very good teacher, and he continues to teach us and make faithful disciples, uh, discipleship rather possible even for us. And with that, please rise and body your spirit as we join together in the call to worship. 
It was easy to come to worship this morning. How hard it is to enter God's kingdom. Get ready. God is waiting for you. Continuing with the opening prayer. Lord, you have called us here this day for healing, hope, and transformation. As we listen to the scripture, pray our prayers, sing our hymns, and hear the words of wisdom, open our hearts to hear your claim on our lives, that we may fully and joyfully serve you. Amen. Please turn in your hymnal to number 467. We're going to sing together our opening hymn. Trust and Obey. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still. Trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. <coughs> not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toil he doth richly Jesus came to serve, not to be served. And that is why we bring back what was first given to us. Those wonderful gifts made possible by God to bless us are then gifts we return to God for blessing to others. So let us prepare for the blessing by singing together the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Glorious God, you are our provider and sustainer. We bring our gifts today mindful of your abundant love and mercy. And as we offer these gifts and offerings, we ask that you remind us of the call to let go of our earthly attachments in order to follow you with our whole heart. Bless the gifts and the givers and use them both to further your kingdom on earth so that all may experience your grace and love. 
And may our giving reflect our trust in you and our commitment to serve others. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and all God's people said, amen. amen. You may be seated. Um, but let, we do have things, though, that we do hold in confidence because we just don't have the agency to share it out loud. And those can be joys and blessings because sometimes we just can't share it yet. So we're going to go to God in silence of prayer, and then we will all pray together. God of infinite patience, healing, and wisdom. We've come to you today with a lot of things on our minds and hearts. There are a lot of things in the world that claim our time, they claim our energy, they claim our resources and our attention, and at times they just take over our very lives. We are easily drawn away from serving you by enticements of the world. Enticements for wealth, attention, ease, and comfort. Just like the young man, the rich young ruler we're going to hear about in Mark, we are sometimes owned by our possessions or held captive by our treasure. Treasure we have or treasure we don't have. But you continue to offer to us healing and hope. You seek to transform our lives from captivity to freedom in witness and service. You look at the world in which, or we do rather, look at this world in which there is so much division and warfare and strife and anger and hatred, and we can easily become overwhelmed. Overwhelmed by the needs, overwhelmed by the stresses. It's so incredibly important to be able to unplug from the world and plug into Jesus. We ask you to help us place our lives and our trust in you, knowing that with Jesus' help, many wonderful things can be accomplished, which will provide hope and peace for others, and in that doing, for ourselves. Give us courage and strength in these days to truly be your disciples. You call your disciples to be people of prayer, so let us share the words that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now that we have reconciled ourselves with God, let us reconcile with one another by rising and passing the peace of Christ in any way that is comfortable for you. We're going to, as we make our way back to our seats, prepare for the word and the word proclaimed by remaining seated and turning to number 407 to sing the hymn of preparation today, which is close to thee.
Sort of linger in the book of Mark, that's really where my focus is going to be over the next couple of weeks. Because earlier in Mark, we hear Jesus tell a crowd they should take up their cross. Now, they don't know what that means because they have not gone to Calvary yet. They don't know what is going to happen at the cross. But there are three passages that follow that are kind of interrelated in a first will be last, last will be first way. These interactions with a rich, wealthy ruler rich young ruler, rather, disciples, who we're going to hear about next week, disciples and brothers James and John, and a blind beggar named Bartimaeus. Now, each of those passages reveals a part of the challenge of taking up our cross and what that means for our daily lives. And I, I also go back to that idea of unplugging from the world and plugging into Jesus. That's what following Jesus means, unfollowing the world, following Jesus. So we're going to begin first reading about a good teacher. We need a good teacher, and that is this great high priest. So this is Hebrews 4, uh, verses 12 to 16, and as I said, this is about this good teacher. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, <laughs> marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to his eyes, the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Next, we're going to hear about another rich man, but he's a very good student. He is the best kind of disciple because he never loses his curiosity, no matter what the circumstances of his life, no matter how bad things get, he does not turn his back on God. This is Job 23, verses 1 through 9 and 16 and 17. Then Job replied, even today my complaint is rebellion. His hand is heavy despite my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him that I might come to, see, to his seat. I would present my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would learn the words which he would answer and perceive what he would say to me. Would he contend with me by the greatness of his power? No, surely he would pay attention to me. There the upright would reason with him, and I would be delivered forever from my judge. Behold, I go forward, but... He is not there, and backward, but I cannot perceive him. When he acts on the left, I cannot behold him. He turns on the right, I cannot see him. It is God who has made my heart faint, and the Almighty who has dismayed me, but I am not silenced by the darkness, nor deep gloom which covers me. And finally, we come to the passage from Mark where a person believed to be first all the time, the rich, wealthy, or the rich young ruler, asks Jesus a very important question, because apparently he's not 100% sure. This is Mark 10, verses 17 to 31. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. 
do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. Looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him and said to him, one thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But at these words, he was saddened and he went away grieving for he was one who owned much property. And Jesus, looking around, said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus answered again and said to them, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They were even more astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? Looking at them, Jesus said, with people it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, behold, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. What keeps you from following? In this passage from Mark 10 today, we have a rich man running up to Jesus with a great deal of enthusiasm to ask the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And it's a question I think all of us have heard or maybe pondered at one point in time. It's something that you hear people talk about. They don't necessarily use those words. It's how, you know, how am I going to get to heaven? Am I going to get to heaven? I believe I'm going to get to heaven. And then you can hear the different reasons why. Because I'm a good person. I'm going to get to heaven because I grew up in the church. Or I'm going to get to heaven because my parents went to church all the time and my grandparents went to church all the time. So I, I give the rich young ruler credit and kudos for asking Jesus what he needs to do to inherit eternal life. Because I'm telling you, some of those answers, they clearly did not ask Jesus for that answer. But just before this encounter with the rich young ruler, the disciples um, encounter other people coming to Jesus with a great deal of enthusiasm, only they're about this high, they're kids. So if you go back and you read before this, these children are brought to Jesus by their mothers, grandmothers, whoever it is that's caring for them to be blessed by Jesus. And, uh, well, old habits kick in. The deeply ingrained belief that children are a distraction, they should be seen and not heard, they're unworthy and unfit of their time, certainly to receive any of Jesus' attention. He's got more important things to do than to be blessing your children. I mean, the women, yeah, go, go get the mother's attention, but you don't need our attention. Because after all, the women were looked down on almost as poorly as the kids. But what Jesus responds to them is so shocking for them and unexpected. He rebukes the disciples for their false thinking and flips entirely that deeply ingrained understanding right side up as he offers them even a visual learning moment, taking the children in his arms and hugging on them and saying, you got to learn to come to me like these guys. This is how you get into the kingdom of God. This is how you do it. Children came eagerly and unashamed of their dependence upon others for what they need. And Jesus loves that. The rich man approached Jesus with similar enthusiasm, totally different outcome. First, I think he's doing a little sweet talk in there with the good teacher, which Jesus addressed first, if you remember. Why are you calling me good? 
that might work on those people that you hang around with at the country club, but it's not going to work on Jesus. And so the one who was used to being served, the one who knows how that system works, there's something going on there that Jesus hones in on, and Jesus says, you do lack one thing. We don't know what the lack is. I think he figures it out. I think that the rich young ruler figures it out. And so he's going to have to go become the opposite of what he is, poor and humble, a servant to others. Would that be hard? Jesus makes the point that would be extremely hard, and you don't understand it. Why? Because like Peter, they believe rich people can do anything they want, anytime they want, with who they want, the way they want. Why? Because they're rich. There's no other reason. They've never walked in their shoes, and Peter really sounds like someone who's not even attempting to walk in that rich man's shoes. Then again, they weren't exactly acting like people trying to walk in children's shoes not that long before. The children and the rich man both approached Jesus with excitement, but the reception was different. The disciples tried to keep the children away, and Jesus says, don't, don't, don't do that. They would never even think to stop a rich man from coming up to Jesus. Yet the children left very happy and blessed, and the rich young ruler left sad and grieving. He was grieving because of the truth Jesus gave him. But it might have been a whole lot of truth going on in his head that we really aren't privy to. Was he lacking real relationship? Because he wasn't sure who was with him just because he was wealthy? Was he worried about what his in-laws are going to think of this plan, sell everything and go follow Jesus? Is he worried about the access that he has to all of these things that he's going to lose? Is eternal life worth what he is going to sacrifice? But then again, is he also grieving the fact he didn't have any of these things? Maybe he's never had a real relationship that was based on nothing but who he is inside. It's so much easier to know that you are in a real relationship when that person has nothing to gain from you. So we go to another rich man, Job, going in the opposite direction here because now we encounter another wealthy man, but this time everything's taken from him. He doesn't lose it voluntarily. It's just taken from him. And the suffering drove him to question God, even to despair, but not to ch turn his back on God. Not to say, you know what, God, you didn't protect me from this, and so we're done. Not at all. He approached God more like the children than he did the rich man. He did not approach God to secure more wealth or even preserve what he had. He sought God despite losing it all. I know some people who were in the hurricane's path. I was absolutely floored yesterday when I, I heard a friend who lives in Nokomis tried to clean up from the first flood and now is cleaning up from the second, praising God for providence because... She has a place to clean up. We're 20 miles north and 20 miles south. They don't even have a place. Grateful that even though they don't have electricity, they might have it by the 17th. That's better than next month. And they have a generator. Praising God for what they have after the storm comes through. There's greater wealth than what the world offers. And everything the world offers is temporary, and you can lose it like that. So the rich man in Mark's gospel, he's facing kind of a crisis of identity, I think. This is how he's known. He's the rich young ruler. It's even the heading that was given to that section. Who is he if he's no longer rich or a ruler? It's possible he couldn't imagine life without his stuff, his mind. In his mind, he was never maybe prepared to not have stuff. We don't know if he earned that money or if he was born to it. But if he was born to it, he wasn't taught how to serve. He was taught how to be served. Very different. And he's going to have to approach Jesus like those children, understanding that they need him. 
He needs Jesus. He's got to unplug from the world and plug into Jesus and follow. This has never changed. <laughs> there are people today that need to unplug from the world, turn it off, turn it down, and plug into Jesus. They even know that the world gets them upset. Doesn't bring out the best in them. And sometimes we'll still fail to see that they need to turn that off, unplug from that, plug into Jesus, so that Jesus can bring out the best in them. Now, there is a lot about this wealthy man going back and selling everything. We don't really talk about. Like, how is that going to impact his wife? Do you think she's going to be tickled with this? Do you think the in-laws are going to be pleased with this plan? Do you think that everybody in his inner circle are going to be thrilled to be associated with this guy going forward? Is their meal ticket walking away? It is easier to show the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control when we have no other choice. But voluntarily is a struggle. So we go to Peter's misunderstanding. Peter thinks like a lot of people did then, and I think, I dare say they still do. First of all, you have to understand in that time, people believed with all of their heart because they were told this, that people who were wealthy and powerful were so because God made them so. So it didn't matter if they plundered and stole and cheated to get that money. The fact they had it was proof that God wanted them to. Is that true? Of course not. But they believed it, and frankly, if you were one of those wealthy people who stole your way to the top, you'd like to believe that lie, wouldn't you? So Peter's really struggling because wealthy people can do anything they want when they want. So what's the big deal? If he could hire someone to sell his stuff. And so he says, hey, Jesus, look, look around. We left everything and followed you. What is this guy's deal? What is the big deal? I don't get it. And Jesus is very kind because he doesn't respond to this loaded statement from Peter, which a lot of those statements from Peter are quite loaded <laughs> before he transforms into the Peter of the book of Acts. But they're having some side discussions, these disciples. They're wondering what they are going to be rewarded for the sacrifices they've already made. And you can hear that in his statement. Look, hey, we already left everything. We're following you. They believe that they're earning eternal life through their actions and applying worldly understanding to a divine mission. It doesn't work that way. Job understands it doesn't work that way. But this is the same Peter who rebuked Jesus for predicting his suffering and death, which makes resurrection possible. And then we've got other disciples arguing over who would be the greatest. So yes, they did leave everything to follow Jesus, but they're far from perfect in their understanding and execution of discipleship. But Jesus' response shows it's not about earning anything. Eternal life isn't the result of a transaction. It is the result of transformation made possible through personal sacrifice. And he doesn't say the rich will never enter the kingdom of God. He says it is very difficult and unless you are going to walk in their shoes or walk alongside them, you'll never know how difficult it really is because your belief is they have it made. Wealth is not the issue, but the heart attached to wealth is the issue. Because let's keep in mind, Judas Iscariot is attached to wealth. He doesn't have it. He's carrying their treasury around. He's carrying the purse of the ministry. He does not have wealth, but he really, really wants it. So if, he's, if this rich man has never worried a day in his life what he will eat, what he'll wear for clothing, whether his bills are paid, what others think of him, or his status in town, or his access to boards or associations that are all tied to his wealth, to give all that up would mean experiencing things he never had before, and frankly, that might be the point.
We don't know if he was born, as I said, into that wealth or if he earned it, just that he leaves grieving. So he's grieving something. He lost something there. It's either the things he's going to sell off and perhaps the relationships that are going to end as a result or the idea of the inheritance of eternal life. He came there also believing he was doing everything right from his youth up. Was he grieving, finding out there was more? Then we get to another person approaching Jesus. This is Bartimaeus, and we're going to hear from Mark 10, verses 46 to 52. Then they came to Jericho. And as Jesus was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a large crowd, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road. When he heard that it was Jesus the Nazarene, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many who were following Jesus were sternly telling him to be quiet, but he kept crying out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him here. So they called the blind man, saying to him, take courage, stand up, he's calling for you. Throwing aside his cloak, he jumped up and came to Jesus, and answering him, Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabboni, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and began following him, on the road. Bartimaeus, the blind beggar, called out to Jesus literally with everything he's got. In fact, he threw off that beggar's cloak because he probably thought, I'm not going to need this anymore. And he approaches Jesus. He hasn't even asked Jesus for healing yet. He's thrown off everything that he owns a lot quicker and perhaps a lot easier than that rich young ruler. But nonetheless, he calls out with everything he has. And unlike the rich man who walked away in sadness, Bartimaeus cast aside what little he had immediately and follows Jesus immediately. This was no simple walk. They're going to Jerusalem. And it ain't Disneyland. He's been transformed because he came to Jesus with enthusiasm and was healed. And his response was he had to follow Jesus. Which brings us to the question God asks of all of us. What keeps you from following? John Wesley preached extensively about the dangers of wealth and attachment, and I've been reading through a lot of his sermons lately. And he, he had... Uh, a tendency to remind his congregation to earn all you can, save all you can, give all you can. But this was not a way to secure salvation, but a way to live life faithfully in response to God's grace freely given. It was never about wealth being bad, because wealth is not bad, otherwise we would not store up treasure in heaven. A different word would be chosen. It's a deeper issue about sharing and as hard as it is for me to imagine, and maybe for you too, it's true that in John Wesley's day, just as it was when Jesus taught about wealth and attachment, it was just not done giving things away. People just didn't give things away. The only way to deal with chaos was resources, which meant if you got any resources, you hold on to them as tight as you could. You held on to them and squeezed them tight, and you hid them away, and you didn't want anybody to know that you had them because then they might want them or they might take them. So Wesley understood that it was as radical when he was living as it was in Jesus' time. But our attachment to possessions, and sometimes it can even be an attachment to wanting to be right rather than helpful, it can be an attachment to many different things that become a spiritual barrier. But the important thing is to understand that those who sincerely want to follow Jesus, just as we are with all of our imperfections, hey, there's a lot of, there's a lot of Simon Peter people in this room. I'm one of them, are you? We are offered God's grace freely. No strings attached. 
What often keeps one from following Jesus is themself. Let us pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we come before you with all of our attachments, our misunderstandings, those deeply embedded in ideas that are a little harder to shake because sometimes those ideas are attached to someone that we love and we miss. And so we struggle. You call us to unplug from the world because it's actually sucking away life from us, not feeding us, and plug into you so that we can be truly filled with life. We ask that you help us to see what's holding us back from fully following Jesus, that we would surrender everything to your good care. We ask you to give us the courage to throw off whatever weighs us down, that you would grant us the peace and the grace to follow Jesus with open hearts, even if we don't know where it's going, but trusting that eternal life is not earned by what we give up, but received by following you wherever it leads. In the name of Jesus, who invites us to follow him in the way of life and love, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. And because Jesus calls us not always in quiet times, but times like these, we're going to sing the following closing hymn, number 398. Jesus calls us o'er the tumult. Please rise in body or spirit as you feel able. Jesus calls us o'er the tumult of our lives, wild, restless sea. Day by day, his love was founded, saying, Christian, follow me. As of old, the apostles heard it by the Galilean lake, turned from home. Jesus calls us from the worship of the vain world's golden star, from each idol that would keep us saying, Christian, love me more. In our joys and in our sorrows, days of toil and hours of ease, still he calls in cares and pleasures, Christian, love me more than these. Jesus calls us by thy mercies. Savior, may we hear thy call. Give our hearts to thine obedience. Serve and love thee best of all. Go now and know that just as Jesus came not to be served, we are to serve and to give our life for the sake of the world. Let us go forth to love and serve all of creation in the name of the one who calls us to delight in all of its goodness. Go now and know that God goes with you. Amen.